tonight, what I want to preach on is simply what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? That's one of the words that's used in the Bible to talk about a believer, you know, somebody who trusts in the Lord, someone who's been saved. Um, and there's more involved in that. In fact, growing up, I remember hearing people say, well, you know, if a person does this and this and this and this, they're not a Christian. And they, and, and that, that school of thought wasn't saying that they're not saved. It's just saying they're not Christians. Okay. There's no, nobody. Uh, so that's the mindset that I want to, I want you to have in your head as I'm preaching through this. Okay. And understand what I'm saying. Cause I'll probably reference back to that sometimes. Now, obviously we're not talking about salvation. Anybody who's saved is a Christian in that sense. They are in Christ, uh, you know, and they're, they're never going to lose that. But what I mean is somebody who is a believer and is living like a Christian, living like a believer. Okay, here's here's some titles that the Bible gives, for instance. Okay, number one, believer already said that. The Bible uses that word a lot. Uh, Believer, meaning somebody who followed Christ, somebody who believes in the teachings, believes the gospel, and follows uh, those teachings of Christ. Okay, remember the Great Commission when uh, Jesus sent his disciples into the world is to preach the gospel and then to baptize those believers and to teach them all the things that Christ uh, had taught them. And, and so that's the idea. We want to make disciples. We want to uh, show them God's word and they want to uh, get them to grow and all that. Okay, so believers, another word is saints. And of course, in our society today, that word gets misused a lot. The saint usually means like it's used, the definition today would be like hey, somebody who just is very holy, you know, a Mother Teresa, which she's not a saint, right? Because in a biblical definition, she's not a saint because she's not saved. And, uh, but a saint in the Bible is simply somebody who is who has been saved, who is sanctified. Okay, now obviously there's a process where a believer grows and is discipled and learns more things about the Bible and God's Word. You know, obviously that's the life of a disciple. But being a, a, a saint, you know, is something that in a sense is, is achieved the moment that we're saved because we're covered in Christ's righteousness. Okay, okay so in God's eyes, we're justified. In God's eyes, we're holy. Uh, we're, a, we're, we're a perfect people in that sense. Now, obviously, in the body, in the flesh, we're not that way yet. Uh, but so, therefore, a believer is a saint. But not every saint acts like a saint. You know, you know what I mean? And I'm not talking about from the Catholic standpoint. I'm just saying not every believer acts like a believer. Not every saint acts like a saint. The Bible actually references servants, the servants of God, the servants of, uh, uh, you know, even how we're even supposed to be servants of each other. And that's a biblical thing. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Okay, the Bible talks about the just or the righteous. You know, one famous verse is where he calls uh, Lot, just Lot. You know what I mean? Vexed his righteous soul. And you're like, whoa, J- Lot was just? Lot was righteous? Well, apparently he was. Okay, and I don't just mean that he was saved, but apparently he, he even tried to act, you know, as a Christian for, uh, for a better sake, uh, uh, lack of a better word. In the Bible, often they're referred to as disciples, the disciples. They don't just mean capital D, the 12 apostles, you know, or 11 after the book of Acts. But this, the disciples, little d, the, you know, everybody who's a disciple of Christ, anyone who's been saved, they should be entering into discipleship, should be learning to grow and follow the Lord. Okay, look at Acts 24. Uh, we'll be in Acts for a little while, so hold on to Acts, most of the sermon, in fact. But look at Acts 24. This is kind of interesting. Uh, early on, they were even called the Nazarenes because, uh, not Nazarites, but Nazarenes because Jesus was uh, from Nazareth. Okay, He was a Nazarene. He wasn't a Nazarite. Jesus didn't have long hair like the pictures portray because they got confused and thought, Oh, he had the Naz- he's a Nazarite, so he must not have ever cut his hair. That's some misinterpretation of the scripture. Okay, Matthew 24, verse 5. For we have found this man, a pestilent fellow, and a mover uh, of seditions among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Okay, so this what's he talking about? The sect of the Nazarenes. Well, he's talking about those who follow Christ. 
right? They're, they follow that Nazarene, and so they're Nazarenes. And, uh, and this is what he's talking about. Also in chapter 24, look at verse 22. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, uh, when, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. So the followers of the way, you know, the followers of that, that, that way is often used in the Bible. Many times it's used in the Bible. And, uh, and it's interesting, modern translations just tr change that out and put followers of the capital W way, okay? Because they're just like, they're adding a little bit too much <laughs> to that. But in a sense, it's correct in that that was the religion that they're following. And I think that probably comes from Jesus being the way, the truth, the life. Uh, you know, when, J when uh, John the Baptist said, you know, he's preparing the way of the Lord, which was an Old Testament, uh, a quote from an Old Testament passage of Scripture. Uh, so the way was just the common thing that was said. This is, the, this is that way. They're following that way, you know. Uh, are you of that way? You know, talking about the, 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 what we would call Christians, okay, which is what the message is going to be about. But I'm just sharing with you some other titles. Okay, so believers, saints, servants, just, righteous, disciples, uh, the Nazarenes, the followers of that way. Uh, these are all things that were used. I might have left some out that I'm not thinking about. But today, pretty much the umbrella term that we use is the Christian. You know, sometimes we'll even in soul winning. Are you a Christian? You know, do you consider yourself a Christian? And we'll we'll use that. And it's become this almost like ecumenical term, really. You know what I mean? Like, uh, for instance, um, you know, I remember a long time ago uh, at our church, we flew the flags. We had the American flag. You know, it's always on the right side of the speaker. And then the Christian flag is always on the left side of the speaker. And if you have a flagpole outside, you had the American flag at the top. And then you had the Christian flag underneath that. And that's the protocol. Like, that's the way you're supposed to do it if you had a flag. Now, I came to the realization that, and I remember actually early on in my life as a pretty young kid, I was just like, what does that have to do with church? And I remember thinking, like, why are we doing the American flag and saluting it? And, uh, you know, it has to be in this certain manner. And I remember when I was in Bible college, like, thinking, okay, when I'm a pastor, like, I, I need to know, like, where the flag goes and all that stuff. So I read this book. I should have known that. My dad being in the military, I probably should have already known the, the customs, but I didn't. So I read this book that tells you how to display the flag and everything. And, like, the first words on there are, like, the flag is a living entity, and I'm just like, whoa, this is weird. <laughs> and uh, so when I became a pastor, you know, I was really upfront with everybody. Uh, well, I guess I, I kind of wasn't at first. I just kind of, we, we decorated for a v VBS. And in order to decorate, I had to take the flags down and I just never put them back up. But eventually I had a Sunday school lesson. I said, some of you probably realized by now that I didn't put the flags back up. Let me be totally honest with you. Here's where I'm coming from. And I taught this whole lesson on the American flag. And it's funny because after that Sunday school lesson, this lady came up and said, but why don't we have the American flag? <laughs> like I just taught a whole lesson about that. And she's just like, couldn't believe it. All right. But early on in my mindset on this, when I was thinking, what is the deal with the American flag? Why are we, you know, I understand patriotism. I understand like, Hey, this is a, a government building. So they fly the flag or this, maybe this guy is an old ve veteran or something. And he just loves his country. So he has a flagpole outside his yard. I don't care about that. I really, I think that's great. I mean, you know, fly the flag. I'm all for it. But I don't understand what, what that has to do with church. Well, I kind of do. I know a little, I studied the history of it, but I'll spare you the details. But my first thought when I first started studying that was like, you know what? I'm not going to fly the American flag in church because it doesn't have anything to do with church. I'm going to fly the Christian flag. And then I thought about that. Let me study about the Christian flag. And the thing about the Christian flag is it's an ecumenical term, which means that everybody out there who calls themselves Christian fly the same flag. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be flying a flag that, identifies me with the Christian church down the street or the, or the uh, Presbyterian or the Methodist or whatever, like we're not the same. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that, and so, uh, so I was like, well, we'll just, you know what, we'll fly the Bible. <laughs> that'll be our, that'll be our flag. Okay. And, uh, and so the Christian name, if you think about it, now it's interesting. You will talk to some people, like sometimes you'll knock on a door and it'll be a Catholic 
and uh, and they'll say, you know, well, I'm not I'm not a Christian. I'm Catholic. You know, I remember one time this lady I was asked it, how you know if if they knew for sure they're going to heaven, and she started saying, oh yeah, I know for sure. She started giving the right answers, and I was like, so where did you learn that? And she's like, well, I used to go to a Christian church. <laughs> So in other words, she's saying like Catholics aren't Christians. Okay. So some people make that identification. It's kind of funny. We used to have this guy, uh, he didn't really come to church. This was many years ago. He didn't really come to church, but he sent his kids on the, on the van that we used to pick up kids. And, uh, and he wouldn't come to church. And one day we were talking to him, trying to preach the gospel to him and everything. He's like, you know, I just don't understand why you call yourselves Baptist. He's like, I don't want to be no Baptist. I want to be a Christian. Because we're following Christ. And another guy, like, you know, it, it, it's the church of Christ. You call yourself Baptist, but the Bible talks about it's the church of Christ. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think you guys understand what, what this means. Uh, so his thinking was you're either a Christian or you're a Baptist or you're a Catholic or you're, and that's, that's the world's uh, uh, understanding of that, okay? But, uh, but for the most part, people understand, hey, Christians, they just put this huge umbrella of anybody who, who follows Christ and, and all that. But let me tell you this, the Bible actually only uses the word Christian three times. It's a good word. I, I still embrace it. I still use it. I'm not, I'm not against that. Uh, I just don't, you know, believe in ecumenicalism. I don't think we need to hold hands with other denominations that teach a different gospel and uh, don't, you know, even some of the methodology of some places I wouldn't want anything to do with. Uh, but just like I don't mind saying that we are a church of Christ, I'd just be careful how I said it because <laughs> some people identify that with a denomination. You know, uh, I'm even a witness of Jehovah, <laughs> but I'm not going to go around calling myself a Jehovah's witness because that means something different. OK, so, uh, uh, you know, these are biblical terms that people have uh, have skewed a little bit. But basically, there are three verses in the Bible that use the word Christian. And we're going to look at that. That's going to be our points for tonight. And I think that each of these points will show you a little bit about what it means to be a Christian. I'm not saying that they're necessarily put in the Bible for that purpose, like this is like to teach us some great lesson, but they do whenever you look at those. So we're going to look at those and find out these three places where uh, the word Christian is used. One place it says Christians, but it's the same word. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. And the reason I was like, well, because of the circumstance and didn't tell anybody about the Bible reading, I'm just going to bypass reading the whole chapter because it's just really this little part that I wanted to look at anyway. Verse 26, Acts 11, verse 26. And when that he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Okay, so the Apostle Paul, who was Saul, he gets saved. Uh, Barnabas teams up with him, and, and he introduces him to the rest of the, the disciples of Christ, not just the 11, but the, all those who are following Christ. And he begins preaching. He begins doing the work God called him to do. And obviously, great things start happening, you know, for the sake of the church there. And it says that apparently somewhere around that time, they began to be called Christians. Now, the first point then uh, that I want to make is this. A Christian is someone who follows certain distinctives that are recognizable, okay, whether accepted uh, or rejected by others. So, the, so Christianity is going to be a certain distinct, some distinct uh, uh, attribute, something that's recognizable by others. Okay, now I'm not speaking from the ecumenical sense, but in reality, anybody who could call themselves Christians could have some of these traits, these characteristics, uh, and theoretically they could even be unsaved and act like a Christian, right? There also could, just kind of like a foreshadowing here, there also could people be people who are saved and don't act like Christians, okay? But uh, but we're talking about somebody who's called a Christian. Uh, it, it's going to be certain distinctive, something that dis distinguishes them as a Christian. So there's some behaviors, there's some characteristic traits, there's something that they're doing that is recognizable by others. Now, 
it's going to be recognized by others that they believe in Christ and they believe in the Bible, right? In those days, they said, hey, those are followers of the way. You know, what way was that? Well, there was a particular way that people were, were following, particular set of things they were saying and believing and uh, things that they were acting upon that led others to say, hey, these are Christians. Uh, interestingly enough, it was somewhat most likely of a, derog a bit of a derogatory term. They labeled them Christians. And uh, that makes me think about the history of the Baptist, because if you follow the history of Baptists, particularly what were called Anabaptists uh, back uh, before the Reformation. Now, just real quick, I'm not going to get into Baptist uh, history too much. Some people say Baptists are Protestant. Okay, there's Catholic and there's Protestant. And others say, no, 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 Baptists have never been Protestant because Protestants are those who protested against the Catholic Church and they came out in the ref time of the Reformation. Okay, so, you, so they say, no, we have this line of Baptists who've gone back to Christ and all the way up to our present day Baptist. Okay, we're all from John the Baptist and, and, uh, and they say that. That sounds great, but th theoretically, like, I mean, who can trace their lineage Every church, you know, this church came from another church, came from another church, all the way back to John the Baptist. And most of us that were saved weren't, obviously, uh, we were, who, who knows what church we were in when we were saved. And none of us were alive back when Christ was around or John the Baptist was around. So in a way, that whole argument doesn't, doesn't actually fit. So let me explain to you what happened. There was a sect of those who called themselves Anabaptists who in the Reformation, they linked up with Luther and some of the, uh, uh, the reformers, and they started what became known as Baptists, not just Anabaptists, but, but Baptists. And, uh, and if you follow, they have a set of creeds that they follow, and, and uh, there's certain particular things that they believe. Uh, you know, eventually you got into guys like Spurgeon, who were Calvinist. And uh, they believe all these things, uh, you know, and then you got like Reformed Baptists and, and people who, you know what Reformed Baptist is? Pretty much it's just Presbyterian. <laughs> okay, they're Reformers, uh, you know. So, uh, so to say, no, 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 we're Baptists, we're not Protestant. It's, it's not that that's not accurate. That is accurate. But there are people out there that call themselves Baptists that are no different than the Reformers. So it doesn't matter what the history of your church is or, you know, any of that kind of history. It just matters what you believe now. Does it match what the disciples believed back then, <laughs> you know, or did you get caught up in following uh, the teachings of men and systematic theology and all that kind of stuff, which some of it's right, uh, but not, uh, but not all of it. So the term Anabaptist was a derogatory term that the Catholics, and again, this was before the Reformation or even after the Reformation, but before that Reformation, these Anabaptists, uh, were believing their own thing that was different than the Catholic Church. And if somebody was converted, somebody got saved who was originally a Catholic, they rebaptized them. And that's what Anabaptist means. And so uh, say, say, hey, your baptism when you were a baby didn't count because you didn't believe yet. You didn't understand. And so that didn't count. So they would rebaptize them. And so the Catholics decided that was a great uh, heresy. And so they would actually kill people for believing that stuff and practicing that stuff because they thought that was contrary to the church, right? So, uh, so they actually began calling them Anabaptists or rebaptizers as kind of a negative, negative term. I think maybe the word Christian was kind of like that, those Christians, those followers of who they called Christ, you know, which we understand that's Jesus was the, the Christ or the Messiah of the, the Old Testament word was Messiah. And they said that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, and so it was kind of probably a negative term. And it's funny how oftentimes the negative terms are what stick and you can kind of just embrace it. You know, I remember uh, when somebody not long after we started the work here, I guess, I don't know, it might have been like a year later. Uh, somebody started calling us hyper soul winners. I was like, man, I like that. We're hyper soul winners. <laughs> it was a negative derogatory term that they labeled us because they thought we were weird and our like overzealous uh, desire to go soul winning. And I'm like, let's embrace it. That's what we are. We're hyper soul winners. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of, I think the, the idea, but you understand the reason they called them Christians is because they knew that they weren't like them. They knew they believed something different. They knew they acted a different way. There were certain things that they did. Uh, you know, they, they not only believed in Christ and believed in the Bible, they tried to live 
righteous lives. They tried to be holy. They tried to be pious. And I don't mean that in the, because there's a type of piousness that's fake and this false out there. But I mean, they, they acted like Christians. There's something different about those guys, okay? And uh, as Christians, we ought to strive to be different and act like a Christian is supposed to act. Don't try to act like you're Catholic. Don't try to act like a monk. Don't try to act like, you see what I'm saying? But act like what the Bible says that Christians are supposed to act like. And that's what we preach on regularly. Uh, and, and that's the commandments of Jesus about how to live our lives. Okay, it's interesting to note... Uh, uh, that they, I, I, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, I already talked about the, how they, it was kind of a derogatory term. Look at John, uh, chapter 13. Uh, the believers or the disciples or the followers of the way, the saints, all these guys, the Christians, one of the things that was supposed to set them apart, according to Jesus, was that they had love one for another. It was a recognizable, man, these people love each other. Like they, they just, there's not bitterness and there's not anger, there's not strife and all that, but they love each other. I'm not saying that nobody ever fought. I mean, because it's not, you just read a couple more pages after our text there and, uh, and you've got Paul and Barnabas having a falling out. So there's, sometimes there's strife and there's sometimes there's things that happen, but as a whole, people saw the Christians as people who who didn't do that. They loved each other. They took care of each other. They, they looked after each other and prayed for one another and, and all that. And that's how we as Christians ought to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ primarily. John chapter 13, verse 11. Um, so here he is at the, uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, he's, he's washing the hands and the feet. So verse 12, actually. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garment and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me master and Lord and ye say, well, for so I am. If then your master, your Lord and master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Now, some people take that literally and they add that as an ordinance of the church. Hey, we need to have foot washings. <laughs> okay. Lord, uh, Lord, help us not ever have to do foot washings. <laughs> I mean, I would wash your feet. If I, if I had to, I would do it. <laughs> but I don't think that's, uh, that's the implication here. The idea is be a servant. If you had to wash your feet, wash your feet. You know, some of the most humbling things that I've done where I'm like, man, I would never do that. I would never be able to do that. But I've had to do it in love for a Christian brother or sister. And it's just like, you know what? I really didn't even think of it as bad as I thought that it would be. I don't want to get into details. Okay. But there's things that we need to do for each other sometimes. He says, I have given you an example. Look at verse uh, 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have love one to another. Which means if they're looking at you and they're like, man, these, there's just no love. Those people don't love each other. You're not being a disciple. You're not being a Christian uh, like you're supposed to be. It doesn't mean you're not saved, for sure. But it means you're not acting like a Christian is supposed to act. And we'll get more on that in uh, in uh, other point later. Okay, so they try to follow the example of Christ in loving and serving one another and, t and being uh, taking... Uh, persecution and not retaliating and uh, all those kinds of things that Christ did. They were followers of that. Look at uh, Acts chapter 26 now. Okay. Number one, a Christian follows certain distinctives that are recognizable by others. Number two, a Christian has a persuasive message. Acts chapter 26. In verse 28. And this is right after Paul preaches this very passionate message. It's a it's it's really great read. Go back and read Acts 26 sometime if you think about it. And and uh, King Agrippa uh, uh then Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And I love Paul's answer. Paul said, I would to God that not only thou but also all that hear me this day were both almost 
and all together such as I am, accept these bonds. He's like, man, I want you to be a Christian. I want you to live like me, do the things that I'm doing. I don't wish that you had these bonds like I do. He's like, you know, chained up. He's bound in prison. He's like, I don't want you to have that. Uh, but I want you, I, I would wish that everybody would be, become a Christian. But Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me. There was something about that message, and I imagine it's more than just the message he was preaching, although that's a big part of it. The Bible says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And so the gospel itself is powerful. But uh, we also see that uh, just the lifestyle that Paul's living, I, I, su I suspect, was astonishing to Agrippa and those who watched him. Okay, not only should the message be enticing, but I believe people should see your life and, uh, and, and, and what you have. Like, what is it that that person has? What is it that's different about that person? We already said that a Christian should follow, should, should be distinct, distinctly, di distinctly different than the world, right? They should follow something that recognize, it's recognized to be a Christian. What is it about that? The world should say, what is it about that person and about their life? And, and what is the message, you know, that I need to hear? What is that that makes them different? I, I believe that this is something uh, that Christ, all Christians should have. Notice Acts 26, verse 29. Oh, I already read that. Sorry. Notice, uh, go back to chapter 16. This is a popular soul winning verse here. Because this is the one place in the Bible where somebody specifically asks, what must I do to be saved? And he gives them the answer. So, like, you know, it should be pretty uh, uh, important and, and hold a lot of weight into how we get saved. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of sleep, out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then, of course, the answer was, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Okay, And he goes and he teaches the gospel to his family and they get saved as well. That's what he was saying. Not, not like if you get saved, then your family is automatically saved. Uh, okay, so... Here's the thing that I want to point out about that. Here Paul is locked up in prison and, and Silas is locked up in prison. And what are they doing? They're singing praises to God. They're singing hymns. They're like, you know, praise the Lord or counted worthy to suffer for his, you know, suffer for Christ. And they're in there, they're singing praises. And then an earthquake happens, like they're even like they they could escape so easily. And the jailer like sees all this going on. He's like, whoa, 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 don't harm yourself. We're here. I think it was, now obviously the earthquake probably frightened the, uh, the jailer. But, you know, I, I suspect that the jailer was like, I want what these people have. I mean, here they are locked up. They've been good prisoners, probably, I would suspect. They're not fighting and, and arguing. They're singing hymns. You know, and they're stopping me from killing myself. I mean, what is it about these guys that's so different? And, uh, and of course, they tell them, hey, all you got to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's it. That's how. That's what someone has to do to get saved. But we understand that most of the Bible, that's, most of the preaching in the Bible, this is why people get confused on uh, salvation and they think it has to be works because most of the Bible is writing to people who believe and saying, hey, now that you believe, you need to do these things. All right? I don't know if I could say most of the Bible, but probably most of the Bible is talking to believers, even in the Old Testament. And it's saying, hey, you are a believer. You, you, you're trusting in Christ. Uh, or you're trusting in the Lord. You need to do these things. You need to live this way. You need to not backslide. You need to not fall. You need to act like followers of the Lord. Okay? And so, uh, uh, so we're not talking about salvation because salvation is through believing on Jesus Christ. But once you believe in Jesus Christ, it's expected that you'll live like somebody who is a Christian. And it's expected that you'll have something about you that is attractive to others. Now look, what attracts the world? 
what the world thinks is attractive, okay, isn't really attracted to them. They know that pleasure is only going to last for a season. They know that, you know, money is not going to buy happiness. They know all these things, but obviously what you, what the world thinks would cause happiness, sometimes a Christian, particularly a false prophet, will key in on that and say, hey, we want you to think that following Christ is going to help you to live your best life now, and it's going to help you. You can be a millionaire like me, and you can have hundreds of thousands of dollars hidden in the uh, bathroom stall. <laughs> How many of you guys heard about that? <laughs> okay. Now, now, all of a sudden, everybody's a plumber, right, wanting to go to a lake, <laughs> lakeside. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, but the, the, the a lot of false false Christians, false uh, prophets will try to key in on that and say, hey, you need the Christian life. You need to be a Christian like me. And they're using that name Christian, but they're not really acting like Christians. They're just like trying to say, hey, well, the, you know, if Christi Christianity is such a wonderful thing, so you're going to have just automatically just happiness all the time, and you're going to have all the prosperity that you want and everything. And if you get sick, you can just pray and God's going to heal you. And then eventually these people sometime in their life find out, well, being a Christian is not necessarily easy. And, and it doesn't like mean that I can't, that nothing bad is ever going to happen to me. Then all of a sudden they just like fall away and they, they're like that, uh, uh, you know, the, the seed that, that, that sprang up, you know, but then, uh, the, you know, when the sun came out it, it dried up and it died. Okay. That's going to happen a lot of time. And of course, most people aren't even going to get saved at a church uh, where there's a false prophet as a pastor. But, uh, but the, uh, but the thing here is that they have some, they should have something about them that's appealing. And I'm not talking about appealing to the flesh, but there's a spiritual longing that I think everybody has. There's something in them that says, man, I, I, I do want to be right with my creator. I do want to know how to live. I do want to know how to have peace whenever I'm in a stressful situation. I do want to know how to get by through trials and tribulations and have happiness and joy and love. And, and I do want to be loved and know how to love my brothers and sisters and, and all that. And that's appealing to them. And even though they might reject it like Agrippa and say, hey, you know what? Some, some other time, you know, I'll listen to that. You almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Uh, but... Uh, you know, they, they, they might reject it, but there's something inside them that's like, man, I, I, you know, I, I probably should listen to this person again. I probably should do go that, that way. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I should, probably should be a Christian, but they don't want to. Uh, you know, what we try to teach around here when you're soul winning and you meet somebody who is, uh, claims to be an atheist is that you would still try to preach the gospel to them. Now that's going to be hard for someone that you say, well, the Bible says they're like, well, I don't even believe the Bible. Right. So we'll try to say something like, you know, well, what do you think a Christian believes that you have to do to go to heaven? A lot of times, ah, just be good or something like that. So sometimes you can say, well, could I show you what the Bible actually says? And I know you say you don't believe the Bible, but can I just show you what the Bible says? And that's the gospel's powerful. So if you can preach the gospel to them, who knows what the Holy Spirit's going to do in convicting them? And so we still try to preach the gospel, even though they say they don't believe. Now, there's sometimes you can tell they're scoffing, they're, they're not interested, they're not going to listen to you, and so you just, you know, those people aren't going to listen. But I've had a lot of people that claim to be atheists that are sincerely wanting to hear what it is that I believe a person has to do to go to heaven. And you can see the conviction in their face sometimes. And I remember this one lady in particular, because it just kind of changed, it really just changed my, my thinking on this. Uh, she said, at the end, I said, so do you think, uh, uh, or, or have you ever heard it that way, or... I can't remember, I said, do you believe that that might be true? And she said this, she said, well, maybe one day I'll believe that. And it's like she was just holding on to like, it sounds good. I, I, I probably should believe it. I, I, I want to believe it, but but I just don't want to, uh, to just, I don't want to change in what I'm trusting in right now, which was nothing. I mean, right? I don't know what an atheist trusts in, but, uh, and so... The thing is that the message of Christianity should be persuasive. And I don't just mean the gospel. Now, like, I don't understand how, how I could show you how to get to heaven and it has nothing to do with your works and it's free. You don't have to do anything for it. Can I show you? Nah, it's dinner time. <laughs> I mean, tonight we literally had somebody say, you know, that they didn't know if they would go to heaven right now. And, and, uh, and Brother Ryan was talking to him and he's like, well, can I show you? And he's like, no, 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 I got dinner on the table. It's like, man, if you really believe that you're going to go to hell if you die, you'd be like, hey, sir, what must I do to be saved, <laughs> right? But the thing is, the, the message 
should be something that's that's quite persuasive. You know, it should be something that that people want to hear. But all, ultimately, there's a lot of people that are that reject that. Okay, they're not going to listen to you preach the gospel, and so they're not necessarily persuaded by that. Now, that's our goal. We need to go preach the gospel to the world. But all, ultimately, there are people who, however, who would never listen to you present the gospel at the door, who are going to look at you and say, "There's something different about this person." There's, you know, I'm watching them in their behavior, in their conversation, as the Bible says. Uh, like even it talks about an unbelieving husband who watches the conversation of the wife. And he's, it might persuade him basically to get saved, right? Because of the conversation of the wife, not, not the preaching of, uh, of the word necessarily, but the, in, the curiosity that says, why is she like that? Why does she love me even though I'm a, I'm a mean man? You know, why does she, uh, she still continue to serve me? Why does she want to go to church so bad? Why does she, you know, love her brothers and sisters uh, at that Bible study or something like that? And that man might eventually say, I want to know more about this as well. And they might come to hear the gospel and get saved. So the, a Christian is somebody who not only is distinctly different from the world, uh, but a Christian is somebody who has a persuasive message. Okay. Now, I've kind of already hit on this a little bit, but the third point is a Christian, someone who is willing to suffer for following his or her faith. Okay, willing to suffer for their faith. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Here's the third place the word Christian is used in the Bible. You see, right away, you can see where somebody might say, wow, I really don't want to be a Christian. If a Christian has to be different than the world, like I kind of like being worldly. If a Christian has to, you know, uh, uh, live this life that's just all joyful and they don't do, you know, certain things and they, they got to endure tribulation, all that kind of stuff. I don't want to be a Christian. But the fact is, you might feel that way, but when you see somebody else going through tribulation, when you see someone else not partaking in certain activities when everybody else wants to do it, you know, you feel like everybody is just like, oh, what a, you know, goody two shoes, holier than thou. Uh, you know, they, you, you feel like, man, you're being ridiculed. You're being bullied. You don't like that. Kind of, but you know, really that person's watching you and that person's thinking, man, I should be more like that. And you, you would be surprised how much respect you get from people when you are true to the Christian life and you take a stand and you're like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to live that way. You've got respect from people. They might not show that to you. They might not tell you that they respect you, but you've got respect from, uh, from them because you're following your faith. And you should be willing to follow that to the point of being persecuted uh, and being uh, going through hardship and trial and, and all that. So what did I say? First Peter chapter 4, look at verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let me back up so we can get a start on this, okay? Uh, let's go to verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Now look, suffering because you were a jerk to somebody, suffering because you were, you were mean and, and ugly to somebody or whatever, that's not the kind of persecution the Lord's talking about, <laughs> okay? This kind of suffering for the cause of Christ means you live like a Christian, you conducted yourself as a Christian, and people make fun of you, people uh, hold, back, hold things back from you, uh, people will discipline you, maybe your boss or somebody discipline you because you're not like everybody else because you're uh, this Christian. These are things that are pretty much guaranteed to happen in the life of somebody who follows the Lord. 
He said, oh, so, uh, you know, so you're saying that that's the only way that you can be saved? You got to live like this? That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm just saying if you are saved, you're a child of God, you're, if you're going to act like a Christian, these are the things that you should do. And one of them is to be willing to suffer for your faith. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is a very convicting verse in the Bible. And I, every time I read it, I have to stop and evaluate my life. And sometimes I'm quite, uh, I start feeling kind of guilty because I'm like, man, maybe I'm not being Christ-like enough. I'm not living godly enough. Because here's what it says in 2 Timothy 3, uh, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And I look at my life and I think, like, how many times have I suffered persecution? It's definitely happened. I've definitely had things happen because I'm following the Lord and people didn't like what the decisions that I took because of my faith. But for the most part, I don't really know persecution, like heavy persecution, people hating you and, 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 and trying to get you in trouble or trying to get you thrown in jail or maybe they're hitting you and stuff like that. Very rarely in my life have I had those kind of things happen. So it kind of makes me like feel like, man, I almost want to do something that's going to make people uh, persecute me, right? But then again, like I said, that doesn't mean you just go out and look for persecution and start being a jerk to people or something like that. Then that wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be genuine. But go to Acts chapter 14. And let me show you another verse here. When Paul preaches the gospel in... He would go to different cities as kind of his practice, preach the gospel, stay there maybe for a couple of days or whatever, uh, maybe sometimes a few weeks. I think one place he even stays for two years, and he's just preaching the gospel and he's teaching the believers, uh, getting them started, if you will. Then he would move on and he would go to another place and preach the gospel and uh, do the same thing there. And then later on, he'd go back to those churches that he started and, uh, and, and go back and visit some of those people, those contacts uh, of people who got saved. And uh, he would go back and then he would, he would confirm uh, them. Let's look at it. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I messed up. It didn't turn pages here. So uh, Acts 14 and look at verse 22 or verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through, uh, and we through much tribulation, I'm sorry, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed." Okay, so he goes back and he follows up on these believers. They're already saved, right? They're already, you know, trying to live right. Who knows what, how he led them, what he gave them, uh, you know, to work on, how to conduct themselves or whatever. Maybe he even left somebody there to continue preaching. I don't know. But uh, he goes back and he says, hey, you must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Now, again, this could confuse some people. And all the things that I'm saying to some extent could confuse some people. And this is why you get people that preach like, well, they must not really be Christians because they don't do this and, and that. Well, let me tell you, none of what I'm saying, obviously, is saying that you have to endure persecution to be saved. You have to suffer and bear all this and you have to, you know, be distinctly different than everybody else. And you have to go out preaching the gospel and everybody wants to be saved because of you and, and all that. No, obviously... That has nothing to do with your salvation. And I'm not saying that, well, it, yeah, okay, that has nothing to do with your salvation. Here, here's the logic some people use. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. But if you're saved, then the Holy Spirit's in you and He will make it to where you will do these things, okay? I don't even believe that. I believe all of us can quench the Spirit. And all of us could choose not to live the Christian life. You know, we could be saved. We could be believers, but not act like believers. We could be saints, but not act like saints. We could be servants of the Lord and not act like servants or act like bad servants, at least. Uh, we could uh, be just and righteous in the Lord, right, through Jesus Christ and not act like that. But at the end of the day, that's what we as Christians are called to do. That's what we should be doing. That should be what identifies us as Christians to begin with. 
So can somebody be saved and not be a Christian? Well, obviously that depends on how you define what a Christian is. But I think from the biblical definition of what a Christian is, I would say yes. Somebody could be saved and not be a Christian because they're not following what a Christian is supposed to be following. Still saved, still going to heaven, right? That's another message for another day I could, I could elaborate on. But they're not acting like Christians. They're not being Christians because uh, of, their, of their behavior. A Christian is a disciple. Okay, now there are in the Bible a lot of examples of people who are saved, they're believers, but they don't follow Christ. Okay, uh, uh, we won't take time to turn there, but you know, there's a place in Acts where it says that the people literally they stopped wanting to associate with the church because they didn't want, you know, some of the things that came with it. So it's, they stopped following them. And it talks about those who continued, however, to be added to the Lord. It doesn't say they were added to the church like other verses do because they didn't want anything. They didn't want to be part of the church, but they were added to the Lord. They still believed in the gospel that was being preached. They still, you know, respected what was going on. They just feared it. Okay, they, they didn't want to be part of it. It was too, too harsh for them. And Jesus preached to the multitudes that, that he says that were believers. They believed in him and they followed him uh, to some extent. But he distinguished the multitudes from the disciples because the disciples were those who wanted to follow him. And they, you know, he told them, hey, if you're going to follow me, you need to be willing to leave all and, uh, and take up your cross and follow me and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, and so that is what a Christian is supposed to be. That's what a disciple is supposed to be. That's what a servant of Christ is supposed to be. That's what the follower of the way is supposed to be. That's the way. And we're supposed to be following that way. Okay, so just three questions. Are you following certain distinctives that are recognizable by others? Are you trying to persuade others about the gospel and the Christian life? Are you willing to suffer for following your faith? If you're doing those things, then you are a Christian. If not, then you can't really say you're being a Christian. Okay, you're saved, you're in Christ, but you're not a Christian. Lord, I pray that you help us to follow you to the best of our abilities. We know we're human. We know we mess up. If any man says he's without sin, he's uh, deceived himself and, is, and calling God a liar. Uh, but we understand that even at our best, Lord, we're so unworthy of, of your grace and your mercy. But Father, as, uh, as Christians, as children of God and uh, believers in your, your word and in Jesus Christ, I pray that you'll help us to act like it and help, help us to encourage each other as we continue to go to church and to read our Bibles and to pray and, and, uh, and do all these things, they even go soul winning, Lord, how that helps us so much in our Christian walk and uh, in knowledge of your word. As we do those things, Lord, I pray that you will help us to continue living like Christians and acting like Christians so that we would be recognized by the world as Christians. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.